On this week's Vaticano, Pope Benedict XVI attends spiritual exercises with Vatican Department heads. We catch up with the Cardinal Preacher. The Diocese of Rome's priests have a chance to say goodbye to their bishop during this audience. Also, the Order of Malta celebrates its 900th birthday, and its leader speaks of one of its members, the Pope. At the Angelus, the Holy Father urges the faithful to confront the spiritual battle of Lent. And we hear from these experts about the legacy of Pope Benedict XVI in themes of bioethics and family life. Finally, this cloistered sister tells us about the power of the monastic life. All this on this week's Vaticano. This week, Pope Benedict XVI and members of the Roman Curia attended Lenten spiritual exercises. It was a major change in pace from a week prior in which the Pope announced he will resign on February the 28th. He prayed and meditated on the words of Cardinal Gianfranco Ravazzi, whose task it was to preach the exercises this year. The Italian Cardinal is the head of the Vatican's culture department and a noted biblical scholar. The exercises were in fact on a part of the Bible. They were written on the theme, The Face of God and the Face of Man in the Psalms. We caught up with the Cardinal in the days before the exercises. On the one hand, I'm excited about this experience because it is the first time that the head of a dicastery or Vatican department speaks to his colleagues as well as to the Pope. On the other hand, I also believe that here is a sort of familiar atmosphere not just because of the relationship I already had with the Pope before he became Pope and came to Rome. But I also think I would like to propose again the big founding topic through a single book, the Book of Psalms, because in the end prayer reveals the true face of God and the true face of man. The exercises were divided into 17 morning and evening sessions from February the 17th to the 23rd. They will be Benedict the 16th's last as Pope. Among his audiences, both public and private, in the final days of his pontificate, the Pope hosted priests from the diocese of which he is bishop, that is, of Rome. He spoke to them for more than 40 minutes, all off the cuff, and much on his experience during the Second Vatican Council. But first, he said thank you. Eminenza, cari fratelli dell'Episcopato nel Sacerdozio, oggi... Today you have professed the creed at the tomb of St. Peter. In the year of faith, this seems to me a very appropriate and perhaps necessary gesture, that the clergy of Rome gather around the tomb of the Apostle, to whom the Lord said, I entrust my church to you. On you I will build my church. Before the Lord, together with Peter, you have professed, You are Christ the Son of the living God. Thus the Church grows together with Peter, professing Christ, following Christ. It is what we always do. I am very grateful for your prayers, which I have felt, as I said on Wednesday, almost physically. Even though I am now retiring, I will always be near to all of you in prayer, and I am also sure that all of you will be near to me, even if I am hidden from the world. The priests of the Diocese of Rome come from all over the world. They were full of mixed emotions, but they reciprocated the Pope's gratitude, each in his own way. I love this Pope very much because I was his supporter just since 1978, uh, 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 during the conclave uh, when he was elected uh, John Paul I and John Paul II. I was his supporter and I was so uh, happy when he was elected and very, very sad now. Well, uh, like anybody else, uh, we are shocked, but uh, we are very ha we are happy. He has taken a courageous decision. He has shown a great humility. He has, as he told us, that he prayed long. He prayed with God. There was a dialogue with God. And from that dialogue, he has come with a decision, a decision for the love of the church a decision, and the, as he has told us yesterday, we are here for the audience, he said that, don't be afraid, there is Jesus. Jesus is alive, and Jesus is, will, will care for his church always. Therefore, we are comforted by his word, and we are happy that the good God will ever give us the shepherd in the church. There will be a, the other Pope 
will carry on the mission. Will be hard worker, quarry man, courageous at the forefront. Be I respect him because it, it, it's it's it's. It's being honest, it's being realistic, and, and the church clearly intends that it's possible, since the canon law exists. Um, but it is difficult. We're losing a man who, who, whose intellect is, is supersedes so many. He's, he's a giant in the church. And, and yeah, it, we lose that, and so we're sad for that. We're, we're sad because a, a Pope is not only a theoretical leader, he's the man to whom you give your allegiance and your in your, your vows, yes, you, 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 you give your, your, your obedience to your direct superior, your, your bishop, your, your, but, but his obedience is to the Pope. Uh, there's, there's a direct link, and so there's a sadness in that. The priests of the Diocese of Rome will likely have a new bishop by next month. All depends on the length of the conclave, which is only weeks away. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Santo. Amen. The peace be with you. And with your The Order of Malta is celebrating its 900th birthday. Earlier this month, they celebrated here at St. Peter's with the Pope, who is also a member. The, the present Pope, um, by chance really, uh, happens to be a member of the Order. He was made a member of the Order when he was Archbishop of Munich. Um, and so he's, uh, you know, he's a great friend of ours and he knows a lot about how we operate and what we do and where we do it. And so with him as, as Holy Father, of course, we've enjoyed um, this very close relationship with him personally. When they met with the Pope, they didn't yet know that he would be stepping down. But in retrospect, it was a farewell of sorts. When I didn't talk to him at great length, um, and obviously we were talking about, you know, we, we were saying how marvellous well, I was basically thanking him for being so kind as to receive us in the way that he did, which was exceptional. Um, and so I didn't, um, you know, I didn't say, how are you feeling and when are you going? I wouldn't have dreamt of saying that. And I certainly didn't know. I knew, absolutely had not a clue that he was going to do that. But, you know, he's, he's a hugely interesting, you know, one of the most able popes of, of modern times. And, you know, the fact that he kept us guessing is no surprise. He may make us guess a bit more yet, you never know. As for the Order of Malta, they are continuing into their 901st year to offer aid to those in need. It's a varied group with a penchant for charity. Well, um, it's a complicated organization. It has many bits to it. Part of it is, is a religious order. In fact, it is a religious order fundamentally. Then it's a huge international aid agency, if you like. Um, then it's a subject of international law. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated it's a complicated animal. It's made up. It's not. It's difficult to put it into one category. It's it's got many facets to it. Fundamentally, it hasn't changed from the point of view of looking after the poor and the sick, and looking after pilgrims, and, and that side of it hasn't changed at all. Um, it's changed in that that um, our military. The military side of it has, has disappeared, except for the fact that we have the part of the Italian army, the medical cover for the part of the Italian army is, is, is under the aegis, if you like, of the order. So we, we still have a military connection. We still have a few people dressed in military uniform. But they are doing, they are not combat soldiers. They are, they are, the, they are you know, they are the medics, as it were. So it, 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 those, that's, the, that's basically where we are with that. And otherwise, we have, we have gone back to what we were doing at the beginning. But of course, it's now on a much, much more different, you know, much bigger scale, quite a different scale. Because obviously, um, from a very small beginning in Jerusalem, the thing has now got itself all over the world. So we have this huge number of people who are now involved in our work, you know, around 100,000 people, just short of 100,000. With the current Pope and also the next to join the ranks, the Order will continue to provide assistance to the most needy in the world. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. In the coming weeks, Vaticano will be taking a look at the imprint Pope Benedict XVI has left on the Catholic Church and the world. This week we visit the offices of Human Life International in Rome, where their staff shared what they view as the legacy of Benedict XVI in bioethics and family life. Well, 
number one, he has been, uh, uh, he is in total continuity with the great magisterium of blessed John Paul II. He is, like him, a great defender of life. From the beginning of his uh, magisterium, he has expressed concern about the low natality in Europe. Uh, he, has a, he has very impressive statements about that. Uh, he has very impressive statements defending uh, life and family in total continuity. There is absolutely no change with the magisterium of John Paul II. Um, lately, um, he has to defend something that was obvious for all persons of common sense, that is natural marriage, the marriage in between a man and a woman. And he defended, he has made several statements that he has been attacked um, because really we are in a very concerning situation where uh, marriage in between persons of the same sex is being legalized worldwide. Now uh, we have laws advancing quickly in the parliaments of France and in England. It's a very concerning uh, situation uh, that we need uh, to be aware. Second, at a more technical level, we have uh, the instruction of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Dignitas Persona, of September of 2008. There, he reaffirmed several teachings of previous magisterium of the, uh, of the papacy of the Holy See on uh, bioethical matters, but he entered into a new thing, a new scientific development uh, that needed to be addressed, which is what to do with frozen embryos. It's a tragic situation to speak about frozen babies that are the consequence of artificial conception, artificial outside the human body. That uh, I'm not going to enter into all uh, the details why that's done, but that's done for due to an, an immoral uh, uh, approach that couples think if they cannot conceive, they have the right to a baby, so they try to conceive it outside the body. And Many times they uh, produce, if we have to say produce because they are not in some ways conceived, they are produced uh, more uh, several um, babies that are not implanted and are either uh, left aside for future implants or left uh, or just abandoned, which is obviously immoral. So there were many people within the church that were trying to find a solution a moral solution to that tragedy. And the moral solution was to propose that women would adopt those frozen babies in their womb and bringing them and bring them to life. But this document that I was mentioning reached to the conclusion that that's not moral, that that's non-natural. Uh, many of us, I myself, to say that I was before this document of the opinion that there was a non-natural procedure because a woman has the right and duty to have her own children but she does not have the right to introduce a foreign body in her womb to bring uh, this uh, uh, frozen baby to light. So the document concludes that section stating that regrettably there is nothing we can do to solve the situation of uh, frozen babies. So the only thing we can do is to convince uh, people not to do it, not to conceive uh, babies artificially. Joseph Meany, a Texan, is studying for a doctorate in bioethics at a prestigious Roman university. He has seen firsthand the work of the Pope in counteracting the culture of death. You know, it was very interesting for me because I was, uh, at the beginning of his pontificate, based in Washington, D.C., and now, of course, I'm based here in Rome. But uh, 
it was always very clear that there was a huge continuity between John Paul II and Benedict. But the interesting thing about Benedict, of course, is he came from a more academic background, uh, being at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and one got a sense, in a way, that he was a little bit of the professor. Uh, whereas John Paul II was really out there, you know, almost uh, not quite the actor, you know, but he was very much a, a person, very extroverted and constantly drawing energy from trips and, and constantly, you know, uh, bringing up issues and, and meeting with all kinds of people, et cetera. And, and Benedict was very much more low key and very much more academic. And uh, one thing that just made us, our heart really bleed for him in a way, was when he went on af to Africa, his first trip to Africa. And on the plane, before he even landed, they asked him about the AIDS crisis. And he just said very matter-of-factly what, what everybody knows, that the condom is not the solution to the AIDS crisis. And, you know, public health experts, everybody is agreed about this. But the journalists on the plane just, you know, flashed out the word that uh, Pope Benedict, you know, is against the condom, etc. And, 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 and the world just kind of attacked him. And it was really amazing because, you know, I've been to Africa many times. Human Life International were present all over the continent. There in Cameroon, when he landed, the Africans themselves were wonderfully happy to see him. They accepted his message. It was not a non-issue. But in a way, the secular media just completely attacked him. And then, you know, the, the governments of, of different European countries, etc., passed resolutions against him. And it, it became this international imbroglio because the Holy Father was saying something that was just obvious. Uh, and even, you know, his words were twisted, you know, and, and et cetera. So one really got the sense in a way that, that Pope Benedict um, was uh, very much more attacked in some ways even than John Paul II. And that uh, he had to, uh, to really defend himself more in the church more on these issues that, that remain very much fundamental but bedrock issues of, of life and family. Human Life International sees Pope Benedict XVI's legacy as one that will last through time. You see, the main issues they are going to see the historians looking backwards is, uh, number one, the solution of the controversy that I mentioned about frozen babies. That regrettably, there is nothing we can do, that, that, they, that concession has to stop. Second, they are going to see how the pressure to give legal status to the union persons of the same sex grew in this decade and they will see that as a problem and they will see him as prophetic being very clear that that is against nature really we have to insist that that's not a catholic issue it is a natural issue and we, we have to be in that issue with all men of goodwill being catholic christians or even pagans? Well, I think certainly um, these last few years, the issue of uh, same-sex marriage is going to be very, very high because people are going to look back and say, how could we possibly have thought that, you know, ugly experiment was going to work? You know, there are already people coming forward saying, you know, I was, I was raised by gay parents and, and, and all the problems that came associated with that. But I think that's going to come very much to the forefront. Also, I mean, in the next 20 years, the, the big demographic crisis is going to be hitting, you know, and then all these societies that are not having enough children just to replace their populations are going to be, you know, a majority elderly. Uh, the average age, you know, in countries like Japan, et cetera, are going to be like 60 years old. So, I mean, that's going to be a big, big issue. And people are going to look back and say, you know, why weren't more people talking about this? And of course, the church was talking about it. And Pope Benedict was doing so very eloquently. I think there's also going to be um, kind of a realization, uh, a further realization about uh, the enormity of abortion. You know, how, how many lives were lost to that ideology, really, of, of, of selfishness uh, and, and denying the right to life. To, to those who are born, because I think the technology, you know, has been moving in that direction, showing us the life in the womb with greater and greater clarity, and all these different scientific discoveries just proving ever more so the importance, you know, and the, and the humanity of the unborn child. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Before beginning the week of spiritual exercises, Pope Benedict XVI spoke before the Sunday Angelus of the spiritual combat man faces as he rediscovers his faith during Lent. 
We have entered into the time of Lent, time of conversion and penance in preparation for Easter. The Church, who is mother and teacher, calls on all of her members to renew their spirit, to reorient themselves toward God, renouncing pride and selfishness in order to live in love. In this year of faith, Lent is a favorable time to rediscover faith in God as the fundamental criterion of our lives and the life of the Church. This always implies a struggle, spiritual combat, because the spirit of evil naturally opposes our sanctification and tries to turn us from God's path. Jesus, after having received investiture as the Messiah, anointed by the Spirit at his baptism in the Jordan, was led by the same Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. On beginning his public ministry, Jesus had to unmask and reject the false images of the Messiah proposed to him by the tempter. But these temptations are also the false images of humanity that have always harassed our consciences, disguising themselves as convenient and effective even good proposals. The core of these temptations always consists in instrumentalizing God for our own interests, giving more importance to success or material goods. The tempter is sly. He doesn't push us directly toward evil, but toward a false good, making us believe that power and that which satisfies our basic needs are the true realities. In this way, God becomes secondary. He is reduced to a means. He becomes unreal. He no longer counts. He disappears. In the final analysis, faith is what is at stake in temptation because God is at stake. In the decisive moments of our lives, but on closer inspection in every moment, we are faced with a choice. Do we want to follow the I or God? Do we want to seek out selfish interest or the true good, that which is truly good? The crowd that joined him here at St. Peter's Square on February the 17th was estimated at more than 50,000 people. The Pope will pray just one more Sunday Angelus with the faithful before stepping down. Here atop Rome's Monte Mario Hill is a hidden jewel. It's a Dominican convent. Incidentally, these sisters carry forward a centuries-old tradition begun by St. Dominic himself. This convent descends from a convent founded in the year 1221. This is the third placement, however, because it has been changed throughout the years. The first was St. Sixtus in 1221, St. Dominic and Sixtus in 1575, and the convent of the Most Holy Rosary in 1931. Mother Angelica and nine other sisters call the convent home. Their particular duty is to pray for Dominican priests. This image of Mary from pre-Byzantine times inspires that prayer. Just three years ago, the Pope also stopped by for Mass and veneration with them. The moment he arrived was a very moving one because, in the end, seeing the Pope so closely, I had only ever visited him with the community, so it was a precious moment to experience as we were able to look each other in the eye. He had a paternal look, kind and sweet. I accompanied him from the gardens to her cloister and afterwards he also greeted the sisters one by one. He wanted to know the names of each one of them, one by one, and seeing it on television would be very different. He left us with a wonderful memory, but above all, he gave us the gift of a beautiful homily just for us. He spoke of the contemplatives as the purifying heart chamber of the church. According to the descriptions he has provided of what his life after the papacy holds, he also will be leading a life of prayer. It's not that I'm happy because it makes me sad that the Pope is leaving, but thinking about his desire, his wish to be a monk, so to speak, retired in prayer and writing, is marvelous to me. Beyond the sadness, there is a great admiration for this enormous humility and courage in doing this. 
For us, it is something nice because we will be closer to him when he was Pope, thinking that he will be living our very same lifestyle. It is extraordinary for us to see him in this light, to know that the Pope will also be effectively cloistered and that he is going to an ex-convent. It is really beautiful to us. Maybe one could never understand this beauty because if a person has never been in a cloistered monastery before, perhaps they will never be able to understand the beauty. They may smile, but I don't think they'll understand. They will, however, feel the effects of prayer that also reaches these people. Most of all, I think that the prayer of the Pope, when he is in the situation, will reach the hearts of the people who perhaps didn't previously believe while he was a Pope. I am sure of this, of the value of his prayer and his silence, because he will surely be in silence and it will reach the entire world. As it is, the lives of these sisters and the Pope in his Vatican Gardens monastery are about to become much more similar.